there are quite a few types of intellectual property. Uh, and as we will see later, uh, the type of intellectual property is not product related, but it's sort of um, divided in legal uh, rights. Um, so basically for every legal concept, there's a separate right. So if you have a technical invention, um, you have to file for a patent to obtain protection. If you have an, an appearance, a nice shape, for example, a Coca-Cola bottle, um, you're looking at the design right. Um, if you have something which is just a secret, there's also a separate legal right to it. It's called a trade secret. Um, and when you have a creative work, then you have copyright. Um, and when you have a distinctive sign, uh, for a product of a or a service, you have uh, you have trademark protection, um, and as we will see on the next slide, one product can be protected by several types of right. So, for in the uh, in the example of this shoe, uh, there is branding, of course. So you have the the car hoop, which is a which is a trademark logo. Um, and you also have the, the styled M in the middle, uh, in the blue circle, which is also a trademark uh, right. And then you have just the general uh, layout of the shoe, uh, how it's shaped, and, and that it can be protected by a design right. And then maybe the sole uh, has something, has some special features. Uh, maybe it has some extra resilience with, with the new Nike shoe. On which the the new marathon record was uh, was ran, um, and this can be protected by uh, by a patent. So from this example, you see that one product that that the rights are not product based, but they are more legal legal concept uh, based. And depending on the product, you can have several uh, several rights if you want. So I think this is when I hand it off to my colleague Flo, and she will um, discuss about trademarks first. So we're going to do a chair switch. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Patrick already said, my name is Flo. I, um, I uh, know something about trademarks and designs, but first we're going to talk a bit about trademarks. And I will also, oh, um, address your question, Geert. Um, I think that's already the second slide. But I first want to um, tell you something about what a trademark is um, and also where you can protect it. Um, and then we have some uh, trademark infringement uh, examples and also the requirements when you infringe a trademark or not. Um, so let's start with uh, what is a trademark? Um, in the law, it says that any sign that is capable of uh, distinguishing uh, the products or services of an undertaking from those of another undertaking. Um, and it should also be clearly and precisely determined by the public, which actually means that a sign has to be distinctive um, for the products you're going to claim it for and you're going to use it for. Um, um, I will come back to um, when it's not distinctive, because that is a bit the question of Geert. Um, first, yeah, what you think about and trademarks are usually words and logos, but they can be way more um, as the swoosh of Nike or an apple with a bite. Um, when it's um, an apple um, combined with telecom products, uh, it's, it's considered distinctive um, and everybody will recognize these um, these signs I also put on the slide, maybe not the left below, which is uh, maybe for the Dutch people, uh, they will know it's uh, crisp, it's vocal, and they try to trademark the shape. Um, and it's really hard to trademark a shape. 
um, because trademark protection is infinite, can be. Uh, so it's quite a, a claim you can lay on a, on a ship, but they managed uh, because um, um, there is an exception on ships that can be trademarked, which is that it's uh, the uh, that it de determines the substantial value of the shape, but here the substantial value of the product is the taste of the crisp, so it could be trademarked. Um, and um, the same is actually with the sole of the heels you see are Louboutin shoes. There was a big case uh, a couple of years and they won last year. Uh, and they have a, a, a trademark, a, a color positions on the sole of a shoe. Um, and um, when, well, then also we, uh, I'm going to discuss a bit. I didn't uh, make a slide on what is not a trademark, but because also Geert asked that. Um, actually, the other side of uh, being non-distinctive is mostly that you are descriptive for the product and services you want to claim your name or any other sign. Uh, a, a figure can also be descriptive because it could maybe say what you try to, to claim. And in the case of Geert, I wrote a bit with the comments. Um, it was an abbreviation, ACMC, but also, um, I don't know, I'm just wondering if you filed the trademark only for the abbreviation or also for the full uh, company name. Maybe you can tell a bit about that so I can uh, try to comment on it. Yeah, so when I, when I registered my company, I, I yeah. registered it as uh, ECMC uh, mm -hmm. and with, between brackets, Ethics and Compliance Management and Consulting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, basically, that is actually why they the I don't know if you filed it in the Benelux or EU, but could be that yeah, the trademark office is the one that um, judges if a trademark is uh, distinctive enough, and when it describes your services, which actually you did between the the um, how do you say that? Brackets, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, then you actually describe your service if you, because it also, um, yeah, the abbreviation would be distinctive enough, I would say, but because you um, also filed it with your full company name, the full company name is descriptive in my point of view, but the abbreviation is not because, yeah, well, you can use it, of course, uh, together, but well, once you file it only as the abbreviation, uh, it is not uh, descriptive for the services you offer. Um, if you want to file your full company name, you could also add a logo, because usually when the name is descriptive, but you add a logo to your descriptive name, the distinctive name of the full sign uh, is actually carried by the logo because the visual elements could be distinctive. Um, so there is an option. I would say um, the most distinctive form is probably the abbreviation. But if you always use your uh, company name also fully, you could also um, think about adding a logo or a special type of letters, colors, uh, images to the full company name. Okay, yeah. thank um, Okay, I think then we also had what is not a trademark. Um, then where to register a trademark. Uh, yeah, usually um, a lot of the times I get a, a, a question, I want to trademark my, uh, yeah, my mark worldwide. I want to have worldwide protection. Well, that is basically not, um, yeah, never really possible. There is no worldwide trademark protection because they are national rights. So in practice, also no trademark is uh, worldwide registered, not even the famous trademarks as Nike or Coca-Cola, uh, because also, um, yeah, you are not in every country active or you don't use 
your trademark in all countries. So start with the base, start with your main markets and then expand to other countries. Um, because also trademark registrations, they, um, they cost something and it's nationally based. Um, also be aware of uh, possible uh, obstacles because maybe you were already using and have your trademark in the Benelux, but perhaps in Germany there was somebody before you that was already using that name. Um, and then there you have an older right, so you have to see, and we can also check that for you if it's still uh, available in that country, the name. Um, there's also, for example, uh, even Apple, uh, that just wanted to share with you, it's a bit of a funny thing that not a lot of people know. Um, in China, there was uh, a company which had trademarked iPads before um, the iPad of Apple uh, became known, um, which means that they now uh, uh, pay a license fee to uh, to this company in China to use the name iPad in China um, because there was somebody before them. Uh, so be aware of also these possible obstacles in other countries and um, yeah, start with uh, checking in one country if it's available or not. Um, now I have some examples for you guys um you could leave in the chat if you think this is a problem or not i would um i'm curious what you think uh if these iox brands are a problem to each other or infringing each other um just say yes or no and then we'll check what the answer is um, Okay. Okay. So yeah. Um, sorry to everyone. No. <laughs> well, no. Sorry. Uh, also, these companies don't have any problems with each other because um, when trademark infringement is first based on if the names are if the if the marks are similar enough. But secondly, and most importantly, also if the products and services are similar to each other. Um, identical trademarks for um, uh, really other products or services, which is here, the cleaning brand Ajax and, for example, the football brand Ajax, they can coexist um, uh, to, next to each other because there are no similar uh, products and services also there will be no confusion to uh, the consumer which sees these brands because they will not link uh, the football club to the, the cleaning uh, brand. That is a bit on where trademark infringement, uh, the requirements of it. So first, are the names similar enough? Second, are the products similar? Um, and can also be, uh, can the consumer be confused about that? Um, then we have a second example, let me see, uh, these two, you think they are infringing or is the right infringing the left? Okay. It's starting dark already. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait a bit still. Yes. Okay. Depends on what was the filed as a trademark. The left is infringing on the right. 
So access infringing on the links, somebody says. Okay, well, I will give you the, the answer. Um, because of course these packages, pack, the packaging of these products are really, really similar, but it's about the trademark here. And actually it is no copycat of AX because AX is trademark, everybody maybe uh, more knows, or there should be somebody of Ireland in here because in Ireland, uh, AX um, is called Lynx because there was already uh, another party that claimed AX in Ireland. Uh, so AX couldn't uh, use that name in Ireland and, and sell these the, the products with AX on it because there was already a shampoo brand or really similar to shampoo, which had AX. So some uh, trademark holders, uh, they choose to, or have to uh, choose another name to uh, market, the, market their products in, in, in different kind of uh, countries. Um, so yes, it really looks alike, but it is AX still. So there is no uh, no infringement here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I heard we're a bit short on time. I will do still one example with you guys. That is this one. Um, it's a, it's a typical Dutch uh, brand, uh, Hexacas, and the left one is of the Aldi. Um, uh, this was a case two years ago, um, and um, there was a question about first trademark infringement, but also copyright infringement. Um, trademark infringement was about if Witte Wieve Kaas infringed Hexen Kaas, um, and just to try to explain it a bit uh, shortly, well, as I said, like first the names have to be similar enough, and it, that is always on the aspect of visual, phonetical, and conceptual uh, similarity. And here, the visual and phonetical of Hexenkas and Witte Wievenkas uh, was different enough, but the conceptual similarity there it was about in court, um, because in an old, old, old uh, um, Dutch language and sayings, Witte Wieve means um, actually it refers to uh, fictional um, yeah, female beings and that is also a witch. Uh, but the, the, the trick here was that the consumer, uh, not a substantial part of the consumer, is known with this, uh, uh, this meaning of Witte Wieve. So, uh, there was no infringement in this case, although the products are similar, but the trademarks were not similar. Um, and also there was something about copyrights. Um, because Hex and Kaas wanted to uh, copyright their flavor, um, and that is not known in the law, uh, but they tried to say that um, that, that is a, a, copy, like a work which can be protected by copyright. Uh, and the flavor was similar to the one of Witte Wieve. However, the court decided not to like um, file a, a flavor in as a, as a copyright because it's super subjective. It cannot be objectively determined. Um, and that is why flavors cannot be uh, copyrighted. Um, so this was the first part on trademarks. Um, I will now, or there are some questions still. Wait, no, there are no questions. Okay, um, then I will give the floor to Patrick again, and then you will see me later on for designs. So welcome back everyone. I've been typing quite a bit <laughs> while, uh, while Flo was presenting. Um, Flo will take over the typing for me again and I will tell you uh, a few things you need to know about patterns. So as I told you before, um, if you have a technical invention, it solves a technical problem, um, you, you have to file for a patent if you want to protect it. 
Um, it's an exclusive right in exchange for publication, so you should bear in mind if you file for a patent, um, your invention is also published. This is why often if your invention relates to software, people choose to have it as a trade secret and not, uh, not file for patent protection. Um, whether you should do the one or the other, um, well, yeah, I can advise you on that as well. So you can protect the uh, device, for example, a CD-ROM, a very successful Dutch invention, uh, uh, but you can also um, protect the process or a method for manufacturing something um, as long as it's in the technical domain. Um, and, and often an, a misconception is that when you have been granted the patent uh, is that it's a, a right to use the product uh, to bring it to the market it's not um, it's a right to forbid others to bring to the market a product similar to yours and what can happen is that someone has patented a technology that you also use that technology but you have improved it and that while bringing to the market your pro your patented product you still infringe an older right of someone else so these are really two different things um, you can license um, your patent to allow also others to produce it if they pay you a royalty um, whereas a trademark uh, is has an infinite duration basically the patent has a maximum duration of 20 years. If you are going to be technical, it can be 21 years, but I think 20 is more easy to remember. Um, and just like a trademark, uh, patent is a national right. So if you want to have a patent protection in China, you should file an, an application in China and in Europe. Uh, we have a bit of a weird system. Um, but initially you can um, file for a European patent and in the US if you want to have patent protection you have to file in the US and this goes for all the other countries. So some basic requirements. Um, if you have want to file for a patent your product should be new, it should comprise an inventive step and it should be industrially applicable and it should be sufficiently disclosed there's a famous uh, dutch patent application which says i have invented um, a new coffee maker but of course i'm not going to tell you how it works because then everyone can copy it well then you cannot patent it because then it's not sufficiently disclosed um, of course this was not drafted by a patent attorney this uh, this patent application <laughs> I would not put my name under it. Um, and also the product should be new, and this is important. Um, this novelty criterion is uh, worldwide and also against any publication you have made yourselves. So um, if you have published on a website your idea um, before filing a patent application, it cannot be patented anymore. Um, so this is also important to know. Um, yeah, and the industry the industrially applicable is, is not a common objection you receive. But when it's a perpetuum mobile, an unlimited energy source, well, this goes against the natures of law and this can also not be patented. Uh, and of course, you will see that in the image, the hinges will just um pull the magnet to the metal and this is not an unlimited uh, energy source so i also have some quizzes um, and we are going to use the chat again so this is a product that most dutch people will probably recognize uh, people who haven't been in the netherlands for quite for, for long might not recognize it but this is the famous dutch product beschuit um, we use it uh, usually either to have breakfast or when a baby is born. Beschuit met meisjes is what we treat uh, the, the people visiting the baby. And they are wrapped in this really tight package and nobody could ever get them out until someone 
saw them with a recess, which is in the technical figure with the number three. And you can put your finger in the recess and you can easily take it out. So the question is now, is this technical enough to be patented? Um, and I see some questions, some answers popping in already. Uh, it's, uh, some more detailed questions I want to ask. Let me come to the, to the questions in a, in a bit. So the, the question I'm raising to everybody, uh, is, this, is this technical? Can this be patented? That you have a small recess in this, uh, in this big product, so you can take it out easily. Yes or no? So I see some yeses, I see some noes. Uh, actually, yeah, this, um, this invention was patented until last year, I think, because then the 20 years expired. Um, and this was invented by a private person, uh, someone who sold beschuit in, in his bakery. Um, and he realized that if he would use it on his own product, uh, he would not sell a terrible lot more. So instead, he licensed it to uh, to a big beschuit manufacturer, Bolletje, um, and they put it on their product, um, paying him a license fee. And the rumor goes um, he earned about one million euros in total in in twenty years, uh, which is the uh, the licensing fee that Bolletje paid to him for putting it onto their product. So um, by licensing it, um, yeah, this was this was quite nice for this uh, for this private person just uh, just a brain spark and, uh, and and nobody had thought of it before so it, this was a quite a successful invention Good so the next one hi um, on the left you see an umbrella um, it's an impliva umbrella um, and on the right you see a sense umbrella um, and sense applied for a patent for their aerodynamically shaped umbrella. Um, so it could withstand higher um, wind gusts. So you know these, these umbrellas which fold over uh, when, when a gust of wind is coming below it. Um, and Sense wanted to patent this. Uh, and Impliva thought, well, this is nice. I want to do this as well. So do you think that this the left product infringes the right product. So I see some new questions. Yeah, I will come back to the questions. So I see a yes, I see a probably. Probably is something as, as a lawyer, well, I'm not a lawyer, but, but in the, I'm working in the legal field, I, I, I like. <laughs> so actually the answer is no. Um, and that is because um, this product was not new. Um, so already in the early 20th century, uh, people had been thinking of an aerodynamically shaped umbrella. Um, so even though they filed for a patent, it could not be patented because it was not new. Um, and when it's not new, you cannot patent it. And when there's no patent, you cannot infringe it. Um, so, so even though if the patent would be valid, it would be patent infringement. But because the patent was not valid, of course, there was no patent uh, protection. So let me have a quick look at the time um, and at the questions. I think we will continue the presentation um, because people might also want to attend other sessions. And then at the end of the session, I will come back to the questions. Is that fine? 
the questions that were asked also in private. Um, so I will give the floor to Flo again to talk briefly about um, designs. And I will start type, uh, start answering the questions which were asked in the, to everyone in the general chat. Um, okay, so this will be our last uh, topic uh, substantially about IP. Can I? Okay. Um, so designs, uh, Patrick already said something about it, but it's really a design can uh, lay on uh, the outer appearance of a product usually uh, or product you use it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional um, mostly you can think about um, something you find in your kitchen or bathroom or uh, also clothing but also patterns um, so for example the pattern of Burberry or something else um, design uh, has to be new and has to uh, have a certain individual character to be a valid design, which means that it also cannot be already public uh, or known to the public. Uh, it has to be really new. You have to, um, well, also not publish it yourself before filing a design, um, but also if another one already uh, made like the, a similar or identical design you can also not file a, a, a de design a, um, registration for it uh, it's a bit less strict than uh, a patent at least in the EU you uh, in the EU you have one year uh, from the date of the publication of your design to still file a, a valid design uh, registration uh, to like make it possible also for uh, designers uh, to first see how it goes and how the market responds uh, but it has to be in the first year after the publication um, it cannot be technical because there we have patents for uh, it has a maximum duration of uh, 25 years um, it's visible from the outside yeah which means you really have to be able to see it, see it so um, and um, in the EU we also have uh, another right um, which is a non-registered design right and you automatically have that from the moment uh, once you publish your design and then you have it three years and after that it will fade away but uh, still a design registration really to file your design at a design trademarks and designs office is usually stronger uh, at least to prove it because you get a certificate uh, and a non-registered design right you automatically have um, but it's not filed in a certain certification or anything um, so you have to prove it with the documents you have if you see another party using your design um, then i also have two questions uh, in the quiz. Uh, this is a, a funny um, case I came across two weeks ago. Um, it's about dish brushes um, and left uh, file the claim uh, to the right. Um, and I'm just curious what you think if this is infringing or not. Design, technically, design, no, not technically, that's just what not, should I not use, but um based on design rights so really the outer appearance of the product uh that is what um you should compare to each other mm, i think i already saw some let me see or oh, this is not a yes or a no yes Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Well, 
Um, um, the court in The Hague at least found that this was infringing. And um, with design infringement, it's always about the total impression the user of the product gets when he sees the product. And here, um, it's really about always the most important elements of the design, which are uh, identically or really similar present in the infringing product, um, as in the round face, as a, as a brush, the hairs, uh, the dress which is used. Um, and the other party said that um, the hairs are a bit different and the dress is wider, but those differences are really uh, yeah, they're slightly different and they are subordinate to um, yeah, the, the total impression of the design. So that makes um, that the design, the total impression of the designs as a whole is uh, really different, which makes it not infringing. Uh, uh, it is infringing um, because the total impression is, is the same. I'm sorry. Um, then the last one. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Um, oh, why I cannot go further? Yeah, uh, this was also uh, also design rights were discussed in this case. Patrick just uh, mentioned. Um, and what do you think design uh, of the design? So really, the appearance of the product is it? too similar to you? Would it be infringing, you think, or not? Please let us know in the chat. Yes, I know. Oh, all right. Yes. Okay, then I will also show you, yes, more yeses than noes. Um, I'll also show you the next slide, um, which was also used. It's like the, the view from above of the two products, the two umbrellas. And um, in this case, the court said that there was no design infringement. And it was mainly because there were enough notif noticeable differences, what I just told, like if the most important and noticeable differences to, well, what you see the elements of the product to the user are different enough, then um, um, yeah, another design can go freely. Uh, and in this case, it was really about, um, let's just let the chat go away, um, like the front and back ratio. So you see that the top of the left, um, is um, yeah, like the stiffeners, the lines are positioned differently too. And the top of the uh, left umbrella is um, um, more narrow also, and on the down too, on the bottom. Uh, so they, the lines are positioned differently, but also the front and back ratio is different. And uh, that made that the total uh, impression um, uh, that was not the same, uh, which makes that it's uh, no design infringement in this case. So it can, they, you can argue about quite, um, yeah, maybe uh, little little differences, but they these were noticeable and uh, important here. So uh, in, uh, there was no design infringement argued. Um, let me see. Then uh, we will wrap it up from for now. Um, we have some take home messages um, uh, we want to share with you. Um, so we talked a bit about um, 
names, logos, uh, slogans, and packaging, which can be uh, uh, can be a trademark. And in the Benelux EU, at least, we have a, a trademark registration system. So you, you should file a trademark uh, in order to also uh, base to have trademark rights. Uh, it is infinite. Um, at first, the trademark registration is 10 years valid, but you can extend it with 10 years uh, every 10 years, so it can be infinite. Um, if there is a technology or, yeah, you have a technical invention, an idea um, which you made, it can maybe be patented, uh, that has a maximum duration of 20 years. Um, if you uh, thought of a product which has a special and unique appearance, then you can maybe file a design registration and that uh, protection uh, lasts for 25 years. Um, if you have a company secret, it's the best to keep it secret because until that point you can uh, base your rights on, the, on a trade secret uh, directive. Uh, and it will also, of course, stay, this protection will stay on, until the time you uh, publish the secret or not. Um, then if you uh, want to know something more about artworks or you made a book or a text, you, um, yeah, you, you have a new, uh, you made a new song or whatever, also software, by the way, can be um, copyrighted and the copyright protection, at least in the Netherlands, uh, it lasts until uh, 70, year, 70 years after the death of the author. Um, so that were basically the five main points of IP we wanted to discuss with you. Um, um, if you still have any questions, we can maybe try to um, answer them now. Uh, and we also want to thank you, of course, for your time and uh, um, the questions you asked. Uh, nice that you also joined in the quiz. I just look at Patrick now a bit, if we, maybe. Yeah, I have been typing questions, uh, answers to questions. Um, I think um, maybe we can share our email addresses in the general chat, that people can email us any questions. And of course, if they have time to stay on, uh, they can stay on. And maybe um, people can turn on the, microphone um, yeah. and ask their questions uh, when I have not answered them yet and of course they should um, realize that this session is recorded um, so if it's sensitive uh, concrete information uh, they should not share it within the group um, and they can better contact us in private uh, so that we can answer your questions tomorrow or next week So if you want to still ask a question now, which is maybe a bit more general or concerns trademarks, because that can just be discussed always. Um, there is no sensitive information on that. Uh, of course, feel free to ask them now and otherwise we will share our, um, our email addresses in the chat. Um, Should I? Okay. Yeah, sorry, there are no uh, questions uh, asked by unmuting. Then I think we will go through um, through the group chat and through the private chats together, the email addresses, uh, and we will get back to your questions next week. Uh, OK, 
Okay, so one question that's coming up is from Kiyoko. Do we really need to include the results of tests in the patent application? Um, yeah, I don't know the background of your question, of course, but in general, you should make it at least plausible that what you claim also can be made uh, or that the technical effect you claim is realized. Um, and if you have test results which underpin that, which can prove this, um, it's always good if you have them to include them. Um, and depending on, on the type of invention, if it seems plausible enough by just writing it down, uh, you don't have to share it. Um, if it seems dubious uh, when you write it down, then I think you should share it. And in general, if you share it, it improves your position. Yeah, the measuring method. If it's if it's just a well-known, often used measuring method, uh, you don't have to include it. Some more questions, maybe? Okay. All right, thank you all for your attention. Uh, attention. I hope you all enjoyed it, that you learned a bit. Um, and I will be here every week in, uh, between four and five, uh, as long as the summer school continues. So feel free to drop by then. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, OK. Um, and if you have any questions uh, later on, feel free to contact uh, us or me also when it concerns trademark and de designs by email. We'll be happy to, um, to answer your questions or to just call privately if you don't want to discuss it in an email. That's also really fine. Um, and um, yeah, I can stop
Hey girls, I think you can stop recording right now. Um, we're just doing some bookkeeping because the chat was quite active and we couldn't keep up. Um, so I think we have some work to do tomorrow to answer all questions. Um, but I think the recording can be stopped.